Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Writing the NIH Shared Instrumentation Grant Strategies for Success. I am Jennifer Woods of Labroot, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroot and organized by Thermo Fisher Scientific, the world leader in servicing science. Thermo Fisher Scientific provides complete workflows from cryo-electron microscopic structural determination of macromolecular complexes in native state to 3D reconstruction of tissues and cells. Thermo Fisher Scientific solutions help unlock mysteries of underlying protein function and cellular process, bridging the gap between basic science and translational therapeutics. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please follow the process to obtain your credit by clicking on the Continuing Education Credits window. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Christopher Dant, consultant at MedCom Consulting. Dr. Christopher Dant has over 40 years experience, first as a medical researcher and as a medical writer and writing consultant in biopharmaceutical, government, and academic settings. He received his MA and PhD in genetics and molecular biology from Indiana University and University of Michigan and was a postdoctoral scholar at University of Vermont. He was formerly a senior writer in academic and pharmaceutical settings, a peer-reviewed medical journal editor, and is currently a consultant in producing grants at Stanford Medical School. In 2005 to 2010, he established the Clinical Publications Division at Genentech in California. He had served on the faculty at Dartmouth Medical School and Norris Cotton Cancer Center and consults with Stanford Medical School and the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Dant worked through the NIH NINDS as a peer review, peer review grant consultant. He lectured widely in academic and biopharma settings on NIH career and research grants, manuscript writing, and basic scientific writing for scientists. Dr. Dant, you may now begin your presentation. All right, thank you very much, and welcome everyone. Uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, a very specific kind of grant that the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH, uh, lets every year called uh, an S10 grant, it's a, it's a shared instrumentation grant. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the specifics of the grant uh, and uh, particularly how to win the grant, how to get, get it funded. Uh, they're very, very competitive, but uh, certainly winnable. And uh, there are a number of things you have to pay attention to. And these are grants that I've dealt with along with, with a more common uh, our grants like R01 and program project grants, the PO1s at um, a number of institutions, currently at Stanford Medical School and Dartmouth School of Medicine. So essentially the S10 grant, and that is, a, the S means shared and it's, it's, a, uh, it's an acronym given to these types of grants. So I'll use it sort of uh, loosely to refer to all of them. But it's a it's it's a grant that funds the purchase uh, or update of an expensive shared use piece of uh, instrumentation, usually uh, well over a half a million to a million dollars, that is not supported by other NIH funding mechanisms such as the R01 or research grant or the program project grant PO1, uh, because they don't fund the large pieces of instrumentation. This grant does. But before I talk to you about the NIH uh, grant, which is what I'm gonna focus on, uh, in full disclosure, I wanna let you know that the National Science Foundation, NSF, um, also uh, has a program called the Major Instrumentation Program, or MRI program, that lets uh, instruments of 100,000 to one, just under 1 million, and then 1 million to 4 million, those are two tracks, the, uh, uh, that are for purchase of, of instrumentation. And the 
emphasis there is on scientific and engineering instrumentation and for research and training, specifically training uh, the next generation um, uh, on, on instruments. Uh, so it's, it's uh, more in the direction of uh, not only research, but training. But unlike the NIH, the NSF grant is a cost sharing grant. It requires a 30% cost share of total project cost. So your institution would have to put up 30% of the uh, funds for that, unlike the NIH grant. So let's switch to the NIH grant. Um, uh, you know, and, and I don't know everybody's background on the NIH, but uh, I'll make it very simple. The NIH is a very large institute that has over 27 specific institutes that many of you have heard about, uh, such as the National Cancer Institute, National uh, Institute of Mental Health, Heart and Lung, uh, Blood Institute, and so forth, and then a number of offices. There are two, uh, there's an institute and an office that, that is um, behind the shared instrumentation grant. I'm gonna talk about those. The first is the Office of Research Infrastructure Program, so ORIP. This is an office at NIH that's dedicated to supporting research infrastructure. So things like large, uh, instruments and, uh, you know, pieces that go with it, such as computers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more about the ORIP, but that's one of the institutes that funds or is uh, sponsors the NIH uh, instrumentation grant. The other is the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, uh, which is, uh, you know, a lesser known institute to some extent. It supports, uh, and it's very wide, wide ranging in its in its uh, support. Uh, basic research, uh, such as the foundations for disease diagnosis, treatment, and, and prevention, uh, it has quite a few offices within the the, the institute. Um, but that's one of the sponsors for the instrumentation grant, and it's interested in co-funding S10 applications that include research project within its mission. And uh, the mission, you'll have to go to the NIGMS website and look at it, but it supports research in clinical areas that affect multiple organ systems. That's pretty wide ranging, but that's what their, their main interest is. So if any of your specific research uh, that you're doing, uh, it, it, say at the NIH, is in this area, that, that would add uh, some advantage to you for an instrumentation grant. Also, NIGMS is particularly interested in uh, promoting um, participation in the uh, Institutional Development Award, or IDEA, states. There are certain states in the United States that um, are underfunded for NIH, and that is, uh, that's why the NIH is looking at co-funding applications from those states, encouraging sharing and collaboration among institutes. Uh, programs in states. And here are the states that um, are historically have had low levels of NIH funding. And, and if you're in one of these states and applying for an S10 grant, that will give you an advantage. Or if you're participating, say, with another uh, institute um, uh, or university or whatever it is from that state, that will give you the, some advantage. Okay, so there are every year uh, let from the NIH three specific uh, separate instrumentation grants or the S10 grants. There's the, the big program basic instrumentation grant, which is limited to institutions that have not received instrumentation funding of $250,001 or greater in any of the federally fiscal years from 2018 to 2021. So if you haven't gotten any any funding uh, of that amount or greater, then you're eligible for that grant. And they are limited to instruments that are only 25,000 to 250,000. These are things like basic cell sorters, confocal microscopes, ultramicrometers, gel, gel emitters, computer systems, that sort of thing. And the number at the bottom, PAR, uh, number is the announcement number. These are the program announcements. And uh, if you were to type that into uh, your Google, uh, you know, search, you will find the announcement. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. 
Then there's the shared instrumentation grant. This is one of the most popular SIG program that provides the, uh, between 50,000 and, and 600,000. And um, generally when combined with institutional support, it enables the purchase of very powerful expensive equipment. And that has again, a separate number for uh, its announcement. And then the final uh, high end HEI program, which is between 600, thousand and one dollar and two million so for example the HEI would support the purchase of of a cryo electron microscope from Thermo Fisher for example uh, or anything that would cost up to two million dollars the the instrument as I will mention in a minute may be more than two thousand but it'll only let two thousand for that particular grant and uh, we're going to talk about the grant but want to know that Every single one of these, each of these has the same requirements. Uh, so they don't vary. It's the only big variable here is the instrument costs. So the main thing I wanna emphasize, and again, I am going to repeat myself because some of this information is really vital and a lot of people miss. First of all, the NIH Instrumentation Grant Program supports purchase of state-of-the-art uh, instrument to enhance research of federally funded investigators, investigators that have NIH funded or funding already. And I'll, I'll discuss the specifics of that. So you have to be, you have to have investigators that are funded by the NIH to start. The other thing is that you're, uh, usually these instruments are too expensive to purchase through a regular project grant. So these instruments that are uh, obtained from these S10 grants are shared, which makes the programs cost effective, uh, cost efficient, and beneficial to thousands of PIs uh, in institutions. Um, so this is not uh, a grant that you yourself can apply for uh, on your own for your lab. This is shared, and it's shared amongst a number of investigators. And these grants are awarded to institutions throughout the United States um, to meet the needs of NIH-funded investigators and other biomedical research. And here is a map that's shown that equal portion of instruments in NIH-funded research projects in each of the nation's four geographical regions. And it's approximately equal throughout, a little bit more in the Northeast, but for the most part uh, equal in uh, specifically uh, S10 grants. Uh, and um, uh, th that is really the number of grants, uh, this is reflecting the number of grants that have been won or, or the success rate. Um, and then this is a showing a graph of the types of technologies or types of instruments that are let by, um, by, by uh, these grants and uh, the rewards and re requests. And so, you see a lot of op optical instruments, mass spectrometers, biomedical imagers, things like that that are quite quite popular that are let, but a whole range of other instruments such as um, NMR and EPR and cell sorters and electron microscopes and so forth. It doesn't mean that the NIH does not support an electron microscope or a molecular interaction system as much as an optical instrument. It just means that there are fewer applications uh, and therefore fewer of those grants let. There is no, uh, you know, particular interest in the, uh, in the NIH to say, well, we really want to fund more optical instruments than electron microscopes. That's not the case. And this is a graph of the uh, uh, amount of money over the last several years for these S10 grants that are let. So in 2021, the ORIP uh, commits to just commit $30 million for S10 programs, but this has decreased by 45% from 2012. So this reduction uh, over the number of years is, uh, makes these grants increasingly competitive. However, the good news is that the general success rate for these grants is about 18 to 20 percent. That's the number of uh, grants that are let versus uh, submitted, the number of grants uh, that, are, that are awarded. And uh, that success rate is generally higher than, say, research project grants, R01 grants, or program project grants, or 
even career awards, which are a little bit higher. For example, the National Cancer Institute in 2019 had a success rate for their research project grants of only 8%. So these are very fairly high success rates, which is the good news. So the grant parameters are very strict here, and you'll have to make your proposal convincing if you want to get your, uh, your application noticed. Um, those, the reviewers on these grants scrutinize the detail. It's a lot of detail, and you miss even one essential detail. They basically will pass it over. Um, but first, you've got to pass the eligibility requirements to get one of these grants and craft a proposal that they'll impress reviewers. So there are certain strategies that I'll talk about that get your application through the process. So first of all, these grants are not for clinical trials. That, does, that means they are not directly funding research uh, activities that are clinical trials and therefore not subjected to the NIH reporting requirements for clinical trials, which is extensive. Um, the request for an instrument must be justified by the needs of active NIH-funded research projects. Um, it is permitted for a funded instrument to be used for the conduct of, of human subject research, but not used for a specific trial, clinical trial, uh, or, or solely for diagnostic purposes. So you can't ask for an MRI or a PET instrument to do simply diagnostics, uh, patient diagnostics. This is for research, research projects. And again, these are shared, okay. First of all, the awards are issued for only one year. Matching funds aren't required, unlike NSF. They must show a shared need among at least three major users, and we'll talk about what a major and a minor user are, to carry out their NIH-funded research. The NIH expects institutions that compete for instrumentation awards to show support for these, in, for, for these instruments for its infrastructure. So, you have to have space to house the instrument, technical personnel to maintain it, post-award service contracts to uh, maintain and operate the instrument, and funds to maintain the facility. None of those things uh, can be funded by this grant. The grant is only for the instrument. So the, the PI, uh, Principal Investigator Project Director, program director must be a knowledgeable facility manager. They must be knowledgeable on electron microscopy, for example. It's important to have the expertise to so that the instrument will survive. It, they do not need to have active NIH uh, research grant or other research support, but it's better if they are funded. It's better for the application. So there must be, as I mentioned, at least three major users who can demonstrate a substantial need for the instrument. And they must be R01 funded. They must have a major research project grant at the NIH to advance the work proposed. Ideally, it would be good to have at least five to eight major users. And I'll talk a little bit about how they're mixed. The minor users don't need to have major funding like an R01. They can have other funding like a career award, a K award, or a non-NIH award like Department of Defense or Department of Energy or even a private foundation. But everyone that applies or on the grant must be affiliated with the applicant organization and must be registered on ERA Commons. And if you don't know what ERA Commons is, look it up on the NIH website. It's basically the application. It's, a, it's the place where you register who you are with the NIH. And every, every investigator has a, a separate ERA Commons um, um, place on, on, on their website. Major users, um, PIs must be on a major basic research grant, such as um, what they call a DP1 or DP2, which is a pioneer or new in innovative award. Those are very large awards. They're very rare to get, but they are major awards. Program projects, PO1s, and our research projects, R01. There's other R grants like the R35 or the R37 that, that um, you can look up. Those, those are also considered to be um, major or basic research grants or a cooperative agreement with the NIH, which are called U grants, like U01 or U54. Those are, those are, if you have one of those, you can be an active, you can be a major user. 
a PI with a training grant, uh, a T32 or a K, K01 or K08 or F, F grant fellowship, or with a small business innovative research, SBIR or technology transfer, STTR, cannot be a major user. So uh, you have to have one of the awards at the top there. Um, awards from multi PIs are counted only once. So if you have three PIs that are doing uh, say work in a similar area, but that they're basically all part of the same group doing the same research. It's only counted one toward this requirement. You have to have a separate uh, grant and a, and a separate project uh, to be a second major user. At least three major users must meet this requirement. So if you have additional major users, say four or five more, they can be added with other funding, such as the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, or private foundation. And again, five to eight major users are ideal, but probably not more than that. That's a, it's a balancing act I'm gonna to talk to you about. This is, some people think, oh, I'm gonna put in 15 major users, that'll really impress them. That's not um, a good idea. All major users must demonstrate a significant need for the instrument in the research. So that's the real requirement right there. And that'll be uh, in, in the application I'll talk to you about, that'll be clear. So they can be individual research, a group of investigators within the same department, investigator groups from several departments at the applicant institute or NIH extramural uh, awardees from other nearby institutions. But investigators on NIH training grants and contracts are not eligible to be major users again. So um, the main thing when you want to start one of these grants is you want to identify at least three individuals who are could be considered major use and have a substantial need for the equipment. Again, it's more better to have something like five or eight. They must be a PD or PI on an active research award, grant or cooperative agreement in basic or translational research. This is um, a little repetitive, but I, this is the actual wording the NIH lets. So I wanna make sure that you are very clear on what these groups are, what, what a major user is. Um, again, the award given to multi-PIs is counted only once. NIH training or fellowship grants, TNFs, uh, do not count, okay, and as, as other, other research uh, grants don't. Other major user investigators can be added, again, from NSF, DOE, DOD, private foundations, et cetera, provided they are engaged in basic or translational research and can demonstrate a substantial need. So every major user will have in the application um, what research they're doing, what the actual number of the research project is, what it is, and how the instrument is going to help them move that research forward. Um, the research can be from the same department or different departments, divisions, or, or schools, <clears throat> excuse me, at the same, at the applicant institution or from nearby or regional institutions. The major users uh, that come from distant uh, institutions must demonstrate the need for the instrument and describe the plans for how they will regularly access the instrument housed in uh, another institution, institution shared facility. So if you were from the University of Connecticut and you have uh, in the major users from MIT and they get the instrument and house it there, how are you gonna get up there to run your samples? Or how are the samples gonna get there and how is that all going to work? So um, that, that's a little more tricky if you're in another institution, but it's certainly something that um, S10 grants have, have seen. Minor users um, may have funding, but, they're, but not NIH research grants necessarily, or they may have new, new investigators who don't have funding. But including such early investigators is really important uh, to your S10 proposal because you're highlighting these supplemental users to show the impact uh, of uses more than just your major, you know, your user base of major researchers, and it has a larger dynamic impact. So if you can show a wide uh, impact from this instrument, you're going to in, in a number of areas, and there's a great need. Um, what you want to be really careful of is that 
you don't overwhelm the instruments so that you don't have so many users that the the reviewer will look at it as um, as the amount allotted time, and there's uh, I'll show you that in a minute, and say you know there's just way too much um, use for this, and it's just not going. To, the major users have the priority, so they must. I'll show you the percentage requirement on that. Institution requirements: uh, domestic, public, or private institutions of higher education, nonprofits such as hospitals, health professional schools, and research organizations. Uh, are, can apply. Applicant institutions must demonstrate a commitment towards continuing support for the use and maintenance of the instrument. That's important. And this is uh, my, my uh, graphic for how this all works. So on the left-hand side, you see the, insti the research institute at the top, they're letting, uh, writing an HEI or a high-end instrument grant to the NIH. The NIH then reviews it over a period of, of months. Uh, if it's successful, the money then goes directly to the institute uh, that's committed to support the use and maintenance of the instrument. And that in that inst your institution will have an advisory committee which will be named in the application that will oversee uh, this instrument's use. And the one person that will be focused on will be the program director or the principal investigator who will also be part of the facility uh, where, where the instrument is uh, maintained. So they have a requirement, and I'll tell you what that is, for that instrument in that facility. But the major and minor users um, are all the ones that use this instrument, okay, in the research. Um, the instrument can be used also uh, by other institutions if they want to pay uh, for its time. Uh, as long as there is uh, there is a lot of time for it, but again, the major users and then the minor users take priority on the instrument. Okay, and here you know we might see uh, five major users and maybe four minor users or something of that nature that um, show the, the substantial need for the instrument. So. The high-end grant, um, and again, all three of the grants that I mentioned are all the same in terms of the application requirements. The funding opportunity, PAR 21126, um, is to make available high-end, and I'm putting this up here because this is what the NIH says, high-end cutting-edge instruments that can only be justified on a shared use basis that are needed for NIH projects and basic translation on clinical biomedical and biobehavioral research. Uh, be careful of that word clinical. It doesn't mean that you can do a clinical trial. It just means that you can do research and run samples uh, for human subjects as well as say uh, other, 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 other uh, samples, animal, animal uh, samples. The HEI program is a single item, allows a single item to purchase or upgrade expensive, leading-edge, specialized, commercially available instrument uh, or integrated instruments notation uh, uh, system. And that is one in which the components, when used in conjunction with one another, perform a function that no single component can provide. That's very important because the components must be dedicated to the system and not used independently. That's very, very important to, uh, to emphasize. And this is what on the right, the actual front page of the uh, RFA uh, or the uh, PAR looks like. Uh, they all have the same structures, uh, the, th the three major grants, and they all have a, the same eight month review criteria. So applications are generally due June 1st, uh, earliest date you can call is May 1st. The review, uh, merit review is September. Uh, and then the advisory council review, which is the second set of series of reviews in January, and the award is made in February. So it's an eight-month cycle. Um, the purpose of the HEI program is, uh, again, to encourage applications from groups of investigators to, to purchase a high-end, specialized, and commercially available. And the award is $600,001. The SIG program is cut off at 600000 There's no maximum price for the instrument, but the maximum award is $2 million. And there are things like biomedical imagers, high-throughput robotic screening systems, x-ray diffractometers, mass specs, 
nuclear magnetic NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, spectrometers, DNA and protein synthesis sequencers, uh, uh, you know, biosensors, electron and light microscopes and cell sorters. This is not an exhaustive list. And if you have a question of whether the instrument you want is um, going to be acceptable, um, I can give you more information on that. So the kinds of things they don't allow are things like developing new instruments. Uh, the HAI will not um, uh, fund anything less than 600,001. Of course, the SIG will. Multiple instruments bundled together, institutional administrative systems, clinical management systems, instruments used for purely clinical care, like billable care, no. Software, unless it's an integrated in the operation of the instrument or necessary for its output. Standalone workstations are not allowed. General purpose equipment, things like machine shop equipment, instruments to furnish a facility, autoclaves, hoods, uh, animal care facilities, equipment for routine maintaining, maintaining infrastructure, standard computer networks or data storage systems are not allowed to be purchased, as are disposable uh, devices, office furniture supplies, or any renovation or alteration to the space for your uh, to house your equipment, the, the shared facility. That is not allowed on this. What is allowed is high-end standalone instruments. And um, the applications for standalone computer system, like supercomputers or computer cluster and data storage systems, will be considered if it's solely dedicated to the instrument, uh, the biomedical research, the instrument that you're using for that. So to promote cost effectiveness, um, the NIH encourages optimal sharing and fosters a multidisciplinary environment. Uh, the instrument should be put in a core facility whenever possible. Foreign-made instruments are allowed. Uh, they didn't used to be, but they are now with the NIH. So the first steps in putting this uh, application together is um, uh, to promote, you know, a cost effectiveness, optimal sharing, and collaborative uh, environment. You want to get it into an integrated core facility, uh, and each applicant institution must propose a PI or PD who can assume uh, administrative as well as scientific oversight. So they'll be responsible for requesting cost extension, no cost extensions, preparing a final performance report in collaboration with the institutional officials at the end of the project period, prepare annual use of the instrument for four years, and help maintain the equipment and train personnel. So that that is all going to be costs that the institute will have to bear. But the PD is going to be responsible for all those things. An advisory committee is going to be named uh, from your institution, and uh, they oversee the usage of the equipment. Things like uh, maximum use, time allocation, delayed plan for the day-to-day -day management and safe operation, a plan to ensure that access to the instrument is, is limited to the users whose projects have received approval from your uh, institutional human subjects, animal welfare and biosafety committees. Uh, that's important. A financial plan for the long-term operation and maintenance of the instrument during the post-award period. Relocation, if necessary, uh, within or outside the institution or change of ownership uh, and recommending a new PD or PI if, if the need arises. So that's the advisory committee's job. And um, we'll talk a little bit about what goes into that. Um, you can submit more than one application, uh, provided that each is distinct scientifically. They won't accept, the NIH won't accept the duplicates uh, or highly overlapping uh, in, uh, applications, such as you put in a new application that's submitted before it, issuance of the summary statement uh, from the review of another A0, overlapping A0, which is the, a new application, or a resubmission in A1, uh, or resubmission that is submitted before the issuance of the summary statement of the new application, or an application that has been a substantial overlap with another application pending approval. Okay, so there's, there can't be any overlap and there can't be uh, overlap on this resubmission or new new uh, application. So they all have to be distinct. So the HCI application, essentially, the, the guts of it uh, really um, are the instrumentation plan and letters of support, 
tell you about some other pieces that need to go into it, but I'm going to discuss these items here. The uh, a resubmission introduction, which uh, is only for an A A1. The justification of need, expertise, the technical expertise, research project section, okay, of major and minor users, um, as summary tables, administrative uh, section, uh, institutional commitment, and overall benefit. Those are the those are the required sections of this particular grant. And then there's letters of support, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what goes into there. Other things that go into the grant are very much like a, re a regular grant, like a research grant, a project summary, an abstract, a narrative, um, why is the instrument important uh, for research, a bibliography, obviously, uh, will be from your research project section. And then there'll be a section on the equipment. What is it? Uh, it's manufactured, it's model, it's, you know, features, accessories, a budget breakdown of the main instrument and accessories, and quote from the vendor, uh, appropriate discounts, et cetera, is required. But let's talk about preparing the actual guts of the application, what goes into them. And I'm not trying to present this uh, with you writing tons of notes and saying, I've got to write all this down. It's all in the RFA. RFA. It's all in the uh, PAR that you will look up. Uh, that gives you all the details you need to write it. Um, it, it it's quite extensive. It's not simple. Um, but you need to read the program announcement before you do anything, okay? Because um, in very detail, and also they change uh, year to year somewhat. Um, but you will get rejected without a question if you don't uh, if you don't include a clear um, you know a clear answer to each of each of the sections. You have to have. Um, I mean, you, you really, your job is to communicate the need for the user group for the particular instrument to study, to the study panel by highlighting the major criteria you utilize in scoring a grant, these grants, and that is justifying its need. Do you have technical expertise? The research projects need it. The administration oversight is good. Institutional commitment is there, and the overall benefit is clear. Um, any of these are poorly addressed, the application will fail. Without question, they will fail. So let's talk about some of these sections, what goes into them. First of all, it's justification. That's very important. Nine pages. Scope of the proposal with the user group, instrument costs, and instrument capability. History of the core facility, where you're going to house it. W describe the instrument and historical perspective uh, about the development and evolution of it. You must show you understand its technology, appreciate the pros and cons of the application and, and perhaps even the instrument as it has gone through uh, a number of iterations and each 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 iteration has new capabilities and why that's important that you understand it. Rationale for selecting this particular instrument important to the research objectives. Uh, compare the requested instrument with other similar com commercially available. So if you're applying for a specific electron microscope and there's others similar to it, you want to show this is the one you need because of its, um, you know, capabilities that, you know, the others don't have, perhaps. Access to existing equipment and why it either is unavailable or unsuitable. Summary of the pro uh, proximal inventory of similar items that might have been used but can't be used for one reason or another. And then you need letters from the owners of the, or the core directors of other instruments that attest to the reason these instruments are just not available. So this brings up a question about how are you going to get, you know, data uh, in your, you, know, you have to show preliminary data on that instrument in order for it to really be convincing. So these are going to be rented instruments, perhaps, or instruments at other institutions in which you've sent samples to, uh, and they just aren't available, uh, or it's not a suitable instrument. Well, there's no other one like it out there that uh, really can give you the answers that you need. Okay, the technical expertise has to be there. You want to describe the day-to-day -day use, its oversight, maintenance of the instrument, uh, expertise of the PI, the user group, and the staff. You want to have to show that you have the technical expertise, particularly the PI, the PD. The technical scientific advisory committee that has to be in there. You want to list advisors and consultants who will give you advice on things like experimental design, uh, use, and application of the instrument. Um, 
data management and infrastructure that will support the use of it. Um, detail a review of the biosafety and biohazard protocols. And the core facility has to be well-defined and available to the faculty beyond just the users group. So I'll show you that in a minute. That's that's here. Um, here is current Weill Cornell uh, Medicine, um, and, and that's a core microscopy and image analysis core facility that's on the web, and it's available to anybody um, through the web. So here you see a specific uh, 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 a web page, and if you were to click on the microscopy section in the upper left-hand corner, it would give you the 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 page on the right showing the microscopy offering. So that it shows a confocal multi-photon electron uh, microscopy, automated optical microscopy in wide field. So each of these, uh, each of these instruments or groups of instruments, there may be, I don't know, there may be more than one electron microscope, for example, all have um, a description of what they are, what's available, uh, and an ability to reserve the equipment. Um, as well as to submit publication and grant information and so forth uh, that would have been used on that. But the main thing is that it, it's for, for core users only. So these are the major and the, and, and, and the, the minor users um, are able to reserve the instrument. In some places you can submit a uh, request to use the instrument if you're outside of that group. But the main thing I'm pointing out here is that it would be good to uh, form a web page like this, even though you don't have the instrument yet, showing what it will look like. You can do a mock-up and show what it would look like for the NIH reviewers saying, yeah, they're really serious. This is where it's going. This is uh, all they're saying about it, how to reserve it. All of that's there. You've really put that together. That's very important. Here's another example at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology of a core facility for the Talos Arctica G2 Cryo TEM, or Transmission Electron Microscope. And that sits there, and it shows you it's what it is, what its capabilities and specifications are, what kind of applications it's used in. Uh, it gives you some resources, where it's located, how to reserve it, and who to contact. And all of that has to be in there, okay? So it's important that, um, that kind of thing is in, in your in your grant. It would even be good to show a picture of it, uh, just, just a mock-up of the page. So the research projects is really where the rubber meets the road in this grant, okay? This is a summary, uh, you know, of the composition of the major user groups, who, who they are, the schools, divisions, departments, where they are, and it, show, it should convey the broad use, and, uh, uh, broad use of the instrument and support uh, it has within the research community. They would have the minor users, um, okay, w with project descriptions. This section will have these things in it, the, their name, the specific aims, very much like a research grant, a background of significance, preliminary results that validate the need for the use of the application of the instrument. The data will be, should be ideally gathered on the requested instrument. If you have one that you can get at another institute by, by reserving it or if you've leased it or somehow able to use another instrument like it or the same one. Uh, what are your experimental procedures and protocols? Okay, demonstrate your understanding of the use of the instrument and its difficulties that may be encountered. The use, application, and need uh, for the instrument in fulfilling the aims, okay, that you've listed on your on your project. Okay, you want to address specific accessories if, if there aren't any. So here's the important thing. You do not want to cut and paste your specific aims from your research project. So let's say you're a major user, you have an R01 grant that's NIH funded, and um, you, you, aren't, you aren't putting that down here. What you're doing is you're justifying, uh, you're not justifying the science of the previously funded grants, that's already been done. The NIH has already passed judgment on that and, and given you the money. You're showing the need for the instrument to complete the research. So your aims and your results and your procedures and protocols are all about the experiments that you're going to run on this instrument and how that is going to provide you with the answers that you need that have not, that have eluded you to this point. Okay, so it's very important that you're not cutting and pasting your aims and so forth and your background from already funded research. 
So the research sections should describe the benefit of the instrument to enhance your projects, the research projects of the major users, and then the minor users. So you want to avoid any redundancy um, if the projects are, if they have similar protocols and you want to make them distinct, okay? You want to make sure that, um, that, that they're distinct in your presentation. And uh, they must demonstrate, again, substantial research need. It's got to be convincing that you need this in order to complete your research. Or let's say your research took off in a new direction in the third year of its funding, and you now see the need for this instrument that is going to give you, go into these areas that you really need to uh, explore. So you want to highlight the equipment need and show how it'll expand and broaden your research. That's the main thing. So you already need to you, you need to show how the instrument will transform uh, what the NIH has already funded. You want to want to show that the instrument extends to science, not just fulfills the needs of the grant. And again, preliminary data is important on similar or the same instrument. Present data and clear graphs and tables. That's very important to the uh, reviewers of this grant. Then there's two summary tables. Um, that uh, list your users, their role in the projects, their title of the project, the funding source, including the grant number and project percent use. Um, you also list the users' uh, use of the, of the instrument applications and accessories and features needed. And again, three of the major users must need the requested options or accessories to justify their inclusion. That has to be shown very clearly. The administrative section uh, is not a throwaway. A lot of people think it might be, but it is really important to convince a study panel that the instrument will be well used and cared for. That's very important. You're gonna, they're going to give you $2 million for an instrument. They're going to know it's going to in, uh, into a core facility and cared for. So it, you describe the facility, describe its location and space, uh, including architectural and engineering drawings if needed renovations, discuss administration, uh, advisory committee that oversees its access, its scheduling, disputes uh, resolution, uh, the role and composition of your technical advisory committee, uh, detailed financial plan, including plans for income from charging the, its use, if you have charging other people outside, instrument maintenance, ongoing support of the service contract, has to have a service contract. Uh, support for the core uh, and technical staff uh, that oversee uh, the, um, the instrument in its facility, and an operating budget uh, showing the first four years that includes anticipated expenditures for staff supplies, instrument, uh, you know, usage hours, anticipated recharge income, things like that. Again, the grant will only pay for the instrument. None, none of these things are paid for, but they need to know that they're taken care of. Institutional commitment is extremely important. Okay, that the, your institute will support the core of the staff and the instrument to keep it uh, for uh, instrument upkeep and the training uh, in it. And a letter from your dean or chair that commits support in per per perpetuity of the service contract for the requested instrument. So the dean has to say, we will provide it, uh, X dollars per year for the service contract from company ABC. Uh, to to maintain this instrument, and it should be a commitment to cover any cost of renovations. Okay, uh, particularly of the of the of the facility, that's very important. The overall benefit in this grant is extremely important, uh, and probably one of the ones that are the most difficult to write. Um, you want to succinctly convey the broad benefit of the instrument to the greater research community. You want to place it in the context of the core facility and communicate its broad benefit to the facility and to the research infrastructure of the university. And then they want you to answer, how will this instrument benefit your major and minor users and move the field forward? That is, what is the impact overall? Okay, and that's really important that you um, consider that. They want to look at a very broad uh, an important impact in science because obviously the NIH has spent a lot of money on your grants. They're going to spend a lot of money on this instrument and they want to know that it's going to provide a major impact in, in um, 
to the greater research community, and it's going to be broad and it's going to be it's going to be significant. So that has to be worded in a way that I think uh, really I think captures that, and uh, that'll probably be one of the harder ones to write. The bio sketches which go in the grant, uh, I only want to say that they must be unique for this grant. They want to show your technical expertise on the instrument. Okay, so you're not just going to be cutting and pasting from other bio sketches uh, for this one. And um, there are six areas that are used in scoring the grant, overall impact and benefit, justification of its need, technical expertise, the research projects that show it need, administration and institutional commitment. Those are the six areas that they use to score it. And the important sections are the justifications of use by the major users. The use, uh, tie it to the NIH grants, is the equipment essential for the, for the research that's been funded by the NIH. Um, justification of the instrument. There is no other instrument like it, and there's no regular access to an instrument you're requesting. So you have to show that this is really it. You have to have this instrument to go forward. There's no other access. There's no other instrument like it. Expertise of shared facility staff to maintain it, and commitment of your institution to maintain the instrument. The grant won't pay again for upkeep. Okay. So things that you should care about when you're writing this grant is the NIH really cares about leveraging pe previous projects. So that's, so they want to, you want to demonstrate the longevity of the instrument and its growth recruitment of users. So you want to show not only, you know, how is it going to immediately benefit it, but in the long range, how is this instrument that's going to sit in our core facility really going to move the field forward? And obviously you're looking out maybe for eight, 10 years. Um, how is it going to benefit um, the user and, you know, that you are going to maintain this thing and uh, upgrade it if necessary, and, and it's important to, to show that. Scientific applications that are transformative give high priority, and of course, anything that you buy through the HAI application should be transformative. These are transformative give high priority. It's going to transform science. Um, so the HEI grant is more competitive. So when possible, you might want to submit the SIG grant instead of an HEI, if over the $600,000 limit. The institutional support for the remaining difference might make a strong proposal because it'll show that your institute is obviously committed uh, to getting one of these instruments. So that might be uh, one, one strategy if you um, uh, think, well, gee, let's go for the SIG instead of the HEI. We'll kick it 400000 to get this instrument whatever uh, is needed. Um, if you, but if you don't emphasize the need for the equipment, clearly the rest of the grant won't even matter uh, and will score low or even not get scored. If you're just replacing an older instrument, that's fine, but you're competing with a lot of applications, so it's better if you can demonstrate the need, show an increased number of users, you need a higher resolution or whatever the need is, it's gotta be clearly shown. And um, even if it's obvious, include a comparison of other instruments to show that this is the only instrument that's really going to, to give you what you want. Um, so you want to get preliminary data um, rather than just saying, well, this instrument will do it better. Seek out centers, core facilities, loaner instruments. Major users will drive the need for this grant. If you include about five to eight major users, uh, that would be good, but don't go overboard. If you had 10, then each will only have about a 10% accessible time and therefore won't be any longer a major user. So, so you don't want too many. That, that, will, uh, that will be a problem. So to give you an idea, if you will go to the, uh, um, the URL at the bottom of the webpage, at the bottom it's an ORIP webpage and it shows you the instruments that are funded through the S10 program, and uh, this is for 2019. It shows at the bottom here a S10 grant that was uh, submitted in 2019 and awarded with Pennsylvania State for a Talos uh, Arctica G2 instrument, $2 million instrument. And this is, uh, by the way, I looked up, if you want to do this, you can go on NIH Reporter, which is NIH's uh, website that uh, allows you to look up any federally funded grant. And this is what you get. It only shows you the abstract, and the, actually the abstract is, includes the uh, narrative below. But I just wanted to point out, this is their abstract, and one of the things that they said about it, that certainly this was not alone, 
uh, you know, responsible for um, getting the funds, but it gives you the flavor for the kinds of things. So it tells you what the instrument is. It's to be required to FEI um, Talus Arctica that is a 200 kilovolt transmission electron microscope. And then it has a Fallon uh, 3EC direct electron detector and a 12 positron autoloader. So those are, uh, you know, pieces that, that are added onto it. Uh, they're seeking to acquire the Arctica for vitrification screening of samples to queue for data collection on the one year old Titan Creos, which is fully operational, although over overwhelmed with samples, but most of which are not ready for data collection. So it, it justifies the need for the instrument, uh, an additional uh, need. And to obtain 3D structures from the cryo da uh, EM data, single particle reconstructions rely on collecting different two-dimensional views of the same object that are then reconstructed into 3D maps. So it gives you, you know, a flavor for what the justification and what they're going to do. And it says at the end, we identify six major users, three minor users, and three other users using a total of 12 labs. <clears throat> the projects are ready for cryo-EM, absolutely depend upon the vitrification screening to su succeed and proceed to data collection and data processing using single particle reconstruction approaches. And then the narrative, which is written in more of a lay language, says uh, this will enable ongoing research of our established major and minor users, um, and that this cryo electron microscope will be used to investigate important aspects of viruses, proteins, protein complexes, polymerase, modulation, RNA, metabolism, DNA replication, complex uh, cell wall syntheses, uh, transcription activation and structure function studies, a photosystem one, which is a little technical, but all of which will significantly enhance ongoing research projects. So it gives you the broad, uh, the broad view of what this instrument is going to be used for, and that's important to convey uh, in, in, in your abstract. Okay, so planning for success on this thing, you want to go six to 12 months in advance. That means starting in November or December uh, for submission in June 2022. The submission uh, of 2021 is probably up way too soon at this point, being mid-March, uh, because unless you have already identified all your users and your administrative panel and all the other things that, you know, the, the facility where it's going to go, uh, Pretty unlikely you've done that already, but if you have, you can try for it. Um, you want to rec recruit at least three solid NIH-funded investigators with demonstrated need, uh, and you want to find a wide range of support. Again, that's important. Demo the request and instrument to show allow <clears throat> your user group to obtain preliminary data. <coughs> Excuse me. That requires advanced planning, obviously. And if you go on the uh, PAR um, announcement, um, each of them are a little different, but at the very end, the agency context, it shows you people that you can contact. And uh, a lot of people don't pay attention to this, but it's extremely important. Um, uh, Jeff Wang and uh, Christina Liu uh, um, is, uh, are people that you can call. They give phone numbers and they give emails. And you can call or email them and they will get back to you. I've done that a number of times. It's very helpful if you want to know specifics like, hey, I want to do this. This is the instrument we want. What do you think? Uh, or, hey, we have three three investigators. Three of them are at different institutions. What would you advise? You know, things that you, you can ask them. Uh, do we have to do this? Do we have to do that? They're very, very helpful. So I would uh, recommend calling one of those people. So one last thing to mention uh, before we uh, finish is the organization aesthetics of your grant. Um, you know, no matter how good your justification is and how well you've shown the need for this instrument, if it's put together poorly, you're going to fail. And um, so I would recommend uh, outlining it to start with, um, the, at least the larger sections. Number your headings to help reviewers navigate. Reviewers, and having been one, I can attest to this, they hate when they start seeing a numbering systems that are so long and you don't know where you are in the grant. If you have a number of subheadings, 
So you got to make sure that the numbers are clear in, in only maybe 3.1.1 or something like that, but not, you know, a string of four or five numbers and make sure all the headings are consistent. Uh, they're all the same. Second headings are bold and italic or bold and underlined. Don't underline, don't bold or italic text, please. It drives reviewers nuts. Just underline the sections that you feel are important. And please don't underline an entire paragraph. That is just ludicrous. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the whole brand is important. Uh, if you find there's a sentence in there you really want to emphasize, underline it. Summary statements at the end of each section help the reviewers in timelines, uh, tables uh, of timelines, figures of approach, those things help. And uh, you want your grant to look like this. This is not an, an instrument grant, but it shows neat organization with all the figures that are boxed with the with the with the captions inside and um very and it's white space in there you know a ton but it's, there's white space and uh, unfortunately a lot of uh, investigators particularly those who are new they just jam everything they can um you know in the in the allotted number of pages uh, because they just feel that they're not going to fit it otherwise and nothing will anger a viewer more than having them look at a, a page that is nothing but one solid block of text. So resist the temptation to do that. Uh, even though you have five inch, 0 0.5 inch margins and 11 point type, don't, don't jam it full of, of uh, put, put a fair amount of white space in there. One last thing, um, if your grant shows a critical need for recent adjustment that the NIH wants to fund, great. It has high impact and significant, a broad range of research. It's really wonderful, but it'll fail because you have unclear English. You have a lot of errors in punctuation and spelling, and the writing is sloppy. It's not clear. It's not concise. It's not logical. And these are the things that are really, really deal killers. I can't tell you how many times I've read a paper as a as a as a uh, a journal editor or a uh, or, or, or a grant. I've reviewed hundreds and hundreds of grants that are full of errors. It just reflects badly on you, on your institution. And it also uh, basically says to me, well, they're not very careful about how they put this together, so I don't think they're going to carry out this research very carefully or very precisely. So you've got to make sure that your grant is letter perfect and have other people read it, uh, have other people review it. Even if it's just for, hey, this sentence doesn't make sense, or gee, there's no period here. Uh, there's a bunch of misspelling errors. That's just deal killers. And that is what I do for a living generally. Um, I, uh, my company, MedCom Consulting, with that email, we review grants from investigators and, um, and also manuscripts. So um, with that, I leave you and we'll open it up for any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Dan, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, does each NIH-funded major user need preliminary data? That's a good question. I would say yes, um, that you want to have, want to show the need for the instrument and therefore you need preliminary data. Now that, that means that you've gathered, you've gathered data on the instrument some way, uh, either through loaner or another instrument at another institution, uh, but you really should have preliminary data. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Vant. And our next question, is a secondary instrument that is, that is used to prepare samples for the primary instrument requested permitted to be included in the proposal? Okay, so as I mentioned, any, you know, I don't know what a secondary instrument means. Um, if it's an adjunct to the main instrument, such as a supercomputer uh, or a, uh, you know, uh, anything that would be used to gather data, to crunch the data for the main instrument, yes, it can be included. Uh, as long as the as long as the instrument or as long as the accessory is used solely for that instrument by the major users. In other words, 
Um, you can't use it uh, for other purposes uh, to generate data from, you know, from some other instrument or some other um, method. It has to be dedicated to the major instrument you're requesting. Thank you, Dr. Dant. Our next question here is, does an R21 qualify an investigator as major user? No, it doesn't. As I mentioned, only uh, the R21 is not uh, a major user um, uh, a grant you can use, no. It has to be an R01, a U01, or the other ones that I mentioned in the presentation, but not an R21, no, or an R03. Great, thank you so much. And we have one more question here from the audience. You said it is better for the PI to be NIH funded. Do you think a facility director would be a poor choice to be a PI? No, they wouldn't be a poor choice. Um, it, it, you know, I got that information actually from the NIH. So it helps if they're NIH funded, but they do not need to be. Uh, I think it's fine for them to be a facility director. The main thing there is that they really understand the instrument and can help if there's any problems with it. They can help say, hey, you can't run these samples. Uh, you know, they know the instrument cold. They have the expertise on it. So that's really the major, the PI, the PD of the, uh, of the, of the grant should be. If they have NIH funding, great, but they don't have to be. That's true. Thank you, Dr. Dant. Do you have any final comments for our audience today? Oh, um, okay. Well, I would just say that um, these these grants are very different than the R01s or the uh, R grants that you're used to. So it's very important that you go to the uh, the um, go to the uh, PAR. The, the I'm sorry, the RFA that I mentioned in each of these. Um, uh, grants and take a look at it and read uh, particularly section four, which tells you how to apply. It's very important that you get a real strong flavor for this before you start writing anything and putting putting in a grant. But again, they're very winnable, uh, 18 to 20 percent acceptance rate. And uh, I would say that, um, you know, they're really a great source of funding for investigators. Thanks. Thank you again, Dr. Dant, for your time today and for your important presentation. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>